right. It is our great pleasure to introduce the woman who has changed the lives of every brony in this room, every brony who is out there and is a brony. We are very pleased to welcome Miss Lauren Faust. Hello. There we go. So I get off the one panel and they say, you're late for the next one. It's like, what? Hi, guys. It's been so long. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. Hello. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Glad to hear it. Uh, yeah, it's nice and bright. Well, so I guess let's start from the beginning. You know, I wanted to ask a very, open, for in terms of you know opening questions, the most general question possible, which is how did you get involved with My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic? Of course, you are the creator of it, but how did you get in the position where you were assigned to completely revitalize the brand? Uh, well, it started out, it was all sort of serendipitous and accidental. I um, went to pitch my Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls project to a Hats... Aw, thank you! <laughs> um, to uh, to a exec Hasbro executive named Lisa Licht. And uh, I gave her my pitch, and I showed her kind of a little animation, animatic real thing that I had. And towards the end of the... Uh, towards the end of the pitch, she looked at me, and she pulled out a My Little Pony DVD, I think it was called Princess Promenade, and she said, do you like My Little Pony? And I said, oh, I, it, well, actually, yeah, it was my favorite toy when I was a little girl, as like, of all my toys, it was my absolute favorite. And she said, she pulled out the DVD and she said, can you look at this and see if there's anything you can do with it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how scared of it were you? How scared of it was? <laughs> uh, I mean, because, because I know some of the fans here in the audience have seen 3.6. Yeah. Well, I, I, I went ahead, I took it home, and I watched it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> I, I, did, I, I didn't know what to say. Um, so I, I called her up, and, and I gave her my honest opinion about it. And, and Lisa is, is amazing. I, I constantly called her my knight in shining armor in the, the beginning parts of the process of making My Little Pony. So she, she asked me if I'd be interested in pitching or putting together sort of a presentation. And um, I put together something really loose. I just kind of scribbled some drawings. I used my favorite G1 characters. Um, thank you. Um, yay, G1. Um, uh, and had a meeting with a few of the people from the brand team. They, they, they just happened to be out in LA. It was just kind of a lunch. And I showed them the drawings and I literally bought, brought my toys from when I was a kid um, to just, I just needed, you know, visual help with the pitch. And uh, it just kind of kept going. I kept kind of going, well, I'm interested, but I'm scared because it's a toy and animation for toys is notoriously usually pretty bad and, and I don't want to make anything bad. So I just kind of kept doing each step. Every time they, asked, they liked a pitch and they asked me to do more, I went ahead and every single time, like I remember I took about six weeks to write the Bible, to produce the, the 40 page uh, Friendship is Magic Bible. And I remember the whole time I was doing it, I'm like, this will be the only part of this that's, that's any fun. Uh, like at, at, when this is when I'm, I'm just gonna do it the way I think it should be done, and I'm not gonna hold back, and I'm just gonna turn it in, and they're gonna have a million notes, and I'm gonna have to change it, and then I'm gonna hate it, and then I'm gonna say I don't want to do it and go do something else instead. But it just, it just that just didn't happen. That just every time I pitched, they kept liking it, they kept surprising me, they kept supporting it, and they kept pushing it forward, and then it happened. It was great. 
Would you say that your conception of G4, as it's known in the fandom, the you know, fourth generation of the show, was in a sense a reaction to the previous generations? Like that you saw things that you liked about it, but you also saw things that you didn't like about the previous generations of the show, and you wanted to say adapt from that? Um, not really. You know, when I was a kid, I had these, these were my toys. These were my favorite toys. And um, I had personalities assigned to them and I had stories that I told with them and when I watched the show I, I was a little disappointed I, I, I wasn't it wasn't my ponies that I saw on that show so I, I didn't watch it I, I think I was 10 or so by the time the series came out not the first two specials um, I maybe watched three episodes and kind of moved on from it I, I liked what I was doing more so when I, <laughs> and it was only 10, so when, by the time, when, when it came time to do G4, I, I sort of, I went back to my inner eight-year-old. I always said my, my creative consultant on this project was my personal inner eight-year-old and went back to my toys, went back to my personalities, went back to my stories, and I embellished from there. Well, and I think it's kind of interesting that you, in a sense, <clears throat> Toys are created so that kids can, you know, create their own stories, but now you're creating the stories that are producing, say, toys. And I wanted to know, you know, how closely or if you have seen any of, say, the merchandise that's coming out now for the new series, and whether it's your hope with that merchandise that, say, kids are doing the same thing you were doing when you were younger, say, creating their own narratives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I'm excited to see, it, it took them a little while, but I'm excited to see that they're making the characters on the show. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, like when I was creating characters like Zakora or Big Mac or, or Granny Smith, I thought, well, of course they're going to make them into action figures or to make them into, the, into toy versions of these characters. And they didn't at first, and, and I didn't think they would, um, but now they are, and it's kind of awesome. <laughs> I think it's really awesome. Aww. <laughs> well, so I want to kind of go back a step and talk about some of the, you know, the shows you worked on before you worked on My Little Pony. Of course, you worked on, uh, you know, Powerpuff Girls. Yes. <laughs> And you also are coming from a background of Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Yes. And I wanted to know what the biggest influences those shows had on your conception, or on, say, even the Bible for My Little Pony was. I mean, was it more artistic, or was, you know, did you develop anything narrative-wise that you adapted? Uh, well, I would say both shows were highly influenced me. Uh, Powerpuff Girls was the first job I had where I worked in story. Um, and working with people like my husband, Craig McCracken, and people like Gendy, thank you. Um, and other just really amazing, talented people that were on the Powerpuff crew, Gendy Tartakovsky, Paul Rudish, Don Shank, and just, uh, just dozens of other nameless, fantastic people. Um, that, I really cut my teeth on learning how to be a storyteller on that show, um, especially in terms of style of like storyboarding. And um, the, those, those influences stick, I think they'll probably always stick with me, um, but they were definitely present in putting together power, uh, uh, My Little Pony. And then Foster's, um, I played a little bit bigger, much bigger role than I did actually, much bigger uh, in, than Powerpuff Girls where I was, I was in charge of story for that show and we were doing scripts for the first time and what was great about Foster's was that it was an ensemble cast and it was, a, it was also about a large group of friends and how they relate to one another and how they live their lives together and just sort of the way I learned to tell stories with as large of a cast um, with the theme of friendship carried right over into My Little Pony very, very easily actually. Would you say that when you're creating, because I know that you're also working on a few series, which we'll, we'll get to, um, that uh, when you're creating a series or when you've worked on the series, that there are certain universal elements that you adhere to, maybe like the idea that a, a show should have a certain morality to it or, or that it needs to be character focused. Do you find that, that there are any running themes in between all the projects you've worked on? Um, well, there's definitely, well, yeah, it, it wasn't purposefully, but definitely, you know, Powerpuff Girls certainly has that, for lack of a better term, girl power thing in it, and that can't be denied, and uh, Foster's was 
about imaginary friends. It was about friendship. Um, it wasn't that I sat down and with My Little Pony and went, I, I have a career theme path <laughs> that I need to follow and this has to be in all of my work. It, it, just, it just sort of happened, but, it's, it, but looking backwards, it certainly seems like they're connected. Well, speaking of your career path, did you ever, when you were, you know, going through through high school or, or beyond, did you ever think you were going to go into animation production, or wh wh where is your background from? Like, where were you going when you were in in school? Uh, well, I I come from an artistic family. Um, my all my siblings are very art. We all drew. Um, I don't remember not drawing um, ever since I was three. Um, and I was always really into cartoons, and I was into cartoons a little later than the other kids were into cartoons. So I was like in high school watching DuckTales, not telling. <laughs> Some of us grew up on that show yeah. as well. <laughs> and uh, you know, not, not telling anybody about it. Um, uh, and I remember there was a point, I think I was in high school, um, when it dawned on me that working in animation is a job you can have and that people will pay you for. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of the clincher for me. Um, I just, I, it, it was, the decision was made. I think it was 14. <clears throat> and I think that uh, actually, well, for some of us children of the 90s, you know, we grew up with the Disney Afternoon. We grew up with the, uh, you know, Batman the Animated Series. And it seems like in the early, no yeah. Yep. If you haven't seen it, watch the episode Heart of Ice. It's amazing. Um, for those of us you know, who grew up in that, with the Animaniacs and those other shows, it seemed like there was an influx of really great shows in the early 90s, and it kind of disappeared. And I've heard a lot of people say that the new incarnation of Milo Pony kind of harkens back to that higher quality story writing. Was that something you were striving to do? Uh, it, it it wasn't that I was trying to go back to a specific time. It's just that I wanted to make something good. I, <laughs> That's a start. Yeah. That's a start. Um, you know, this, this isn't, it's, working in animation isn't an easy job, especially when you're in the higher positions like creator or director or producer or head writer. It's, it takes up a lot of your time. It kind of eats your life, and it's, it's, it's not worth it unless what ends up on that screen is something you can point to and say you're proud of. I think that's true of a lot of things in life, if not everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to then go into the actual creation process you have for developing this show, you know, this show that these people are here to talk about. <laughs> um, when you were developing Generation 4, one thing that when we were talking in New York, when we were doing the panel there, you said that characterization was really what you focused on when you were developing the Bible. Um, I wanted to know how long you worked on developing, say, you know, obviously the show is anchored on six main characters that have very distinctive personalities. What was the genesis process for developing those six characters? Did you already know going in that you were going to have a main six with certain characteristic traits, or did you sit down and think, okay, I need a certain number and work from there? Uh, well, I started knowing that I wanted it to be an ensemble cast. I didn't have the exact number six in my head, but I, I wanted, you know, Hasbro had asked, they wanted the show to be about friendship, so I wanted it to be about a group of friends. I also, you know, have had years and years and years and years of ideas of what would make a great girls cartoon in my head. So. It didn't take me a terribly long time because honestly, I've been thinking about it for 15 years. <laughs> um, so what I did is, is again, I went, I went back to the way I played with the toys. When I was a kid, I went into my living room where my husband and I have our toy collections on proud display and I had my ponies from my childhood in a glass case and I went through and I tried to remember which ones I played with the most and then I pulled them out and um, thought about who I made them when I was little. And uh, I remember when I was refining them and trying to just boil them down to their core essences, I was trying to think of icons of girliness um, and pulling that, you know, these, these six characters that I had and trying to pull that kind of iconography out of it, and then you have, you know, you have the tough girl, you have the waif, you have the debutante, you have the, you know, the smarty pants. You know, it, it, 
it, they, they were just kind of, it didn't take me too long to draw that out, but that, that was what I was looking for, but I, I kind of figured it out in an evening. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, you kind of thought up all the stereotypes you could and how you could break those stereotypes? Yeah, I mean, but that, that wasn't, I've been thinking about that forever. <laughs> you know, I, I've been unsatisfied with girls' entertainment for a very long time, and I'll see something that people say is aimed at girls, and then I can't help myself try to think about how I would make it better. And, you know, most of them have the same nice little sweet girl, and they've got six versions of the same nice girl, and they all like to share, and they all dance ballet and eat cupcakes and that's that's all you ever see. And there are some cupcakes involved with this show as well. <laughs> but only one! Um, you know, so it, it, it was, it, it, I did want to break stereotypes because we see the same thing over and over and over and over again and I don't think it truly reflects, I don't think it truly reflects what girls are and I wanted to point to something that people could feel, w watch that character and go, either I'm like that or I have a friend who's like that. When you were approached by Hasbro, I, I'm going to pose a hypothetical. Let's say they came up to you with, say, a different series or a different brand than My Little Pony, and they specifically said they were going to come up to you with, because they've, of course, since revamped Care Bears and, and now they're working on My Little's Pet Shop. If they had come up to you with one of those brands and said, we want you to apply what you've been thinking about in terms of revitalizing, you know, female-oriented, you know, television. Would you have jumped on it as you did with My Little Pony, or is there something specifically, like, you know, special to you for this brand? I, I, I would not have. I, I, it was absolutely because it was My Little Pony. <laughs> so, you put in a lot of time on creating a show Bible, and I wanted to know if there were any deal-breaking elements in your Bible. When you came back to Hasbro and said, okay, here's my vision for the show, was there any line that you drew and said, if we don't have this, I'm not doing it? Uh, yeah, and they were hit quite a few times. Um, I almost walked quite a few times in the mm. beginning. Um, uh, you know, for me, I think the big one was I, I just, I don't want it to be stupid. I just don't want it to be stupid. Um, and I don't want it to be wimpy. Like, I, I believe that you can make compelling, interesting stories for little girls without treating them like they're two. Um, and I was worried that if there was too many rules about being nice and being polite and that these characters could never have arguments or there could never be any, even the slightest sense of danger in there. If, if I couldn't tell good stories, I, I wouldn't have done it. Well, and I think something too that a lot of fans, when they look at the idea of the setting of Equestria, a lot of people you know, are often making the joke, you know, where's the portal to Equestria or whatever. A lot of them look at it like it's some sort of idealized world, but in a sense, you had to intentionally create it to have flaws in order to have that kind of character development. You know, things do go wrong in Equestria. Yeah. Is, and is that something that you kind of wrote into the Bible at the beginning, like this is not going to be a happy-go-lucky, perfect realm? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I wanted to actually then go into how you developed uh, the, the setting of Equestria. I mean, there are certain elements, especially... You know, for those of us in here, I, I think a few of us have heard of Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you look at the show, there are certain episodes that definitely draw upon that. And I wanted to know, like, for example, there's the episode Dragon Shy, where you have the dragon guarding some treasure in a cave at the top of a mountain producing, well, smog. Um, <laughs> you know, or, or you look at, say, the design of Canterlot. And I know that some people have drawn parallels to, say, Minas Tirith, you know, from the the movies or whatever. Yes, they are right. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other specific, you know, elements that maybe you referenced when you're trying to develop the world? Yeah, I, I was looking at um, just classic fantasy, like you said, Lord of the Rings, big influence. Chronicles of Narnia, big influence. Um, uh, Wizard of Oz was was another one. I, I wanted that feeling of of magic um, in there. I wanted a feeling of kind of uh, classicness. I also looked into just plain old Greek mythology because I've just loved that since I was a kid. Um, and uh, uh, fairy tales, classic, 
classic fairy tales, even simple ones like Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty and even that, that sort of stuff. They, those were all the sorts of things I was looking at and trying to evoke. Well, and I can say as a, uh, as a classics major myself and having a friend named Will, Phil Papers, who's out there in the internet, we both thank you for the inclusion of all those classic uh, mythological characters because that's something actually right off the bat that I saw when I first saw the first episodes. There's, there's a manticore. Yeah. You know, or there, there's a, a, you know, Cerberus appears in an episode. Yeah. Um, you look at Cloudsdale, it's got a very distinctive look. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it just seemed obvious and natural. We have characters that are unicorns, which are classic European mythological beast, and we have Pegasus, which are from Greek mythology. It just made sense to me to incorporate that within it, because th those, those characters, those creatures, are, they're already there, and bringing in elements of the mythology they're from just, just seemed like it would a, a natural fit. Well, and aside from you know the mythological elements, it, it, the show definitely has a set geography to it. I should say. I mean, and, and we've talked about this before. That I know that when you developed the Bible, you developed it with a little bit of room for growth, et cetera. But what were the core geographic areas in, in uh, Equestria that you knew had to be there? I mean, I imagine Canterlot was there, and of mm -hmm. course Ponyville. But mm -hmm. you know, there's there's the Everfree Forest, and then we find out there's a desert area. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what elements you had written in at the beginning. You know, at the beginning, I only had, I had Canterlot, I had Ponyville, which was originally called Philadelphia. <laughs> um, I had uh, Cloudsdale and the Everfree Forest, and, and that was it. That was, that was all I started with, but I, I knew that, that we would grow from there. Did you create those locations with the intent of, like, for example, I find and when I watch the episodes that the Everfree Forest, in a sense, serves a story function that, that, you know, it's not just there as scenery. It's kind of the place where things can go wrong. You yeah. Know, it's the place that people can explore and have to, you know, be guided through, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When you were picking out these locations, did you have that kind of intent behind each one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think that goes baked in with everything. I, I don't, I think idealistic is boring. Um, so like if you just have a place where everything's perfect and nothing ever goes wrong, you're not gonna tell very interesting stories. So like every, everything about this show, including the locations, including the characters, they all have room for something, something to go wrong. They all have flaws that are gonna reflect back on the characters and that's, that's where you get your stories from. Well, then now, Looking after you've developed the show, well, before we go on to that, actually, I wanted to ask, there have been several differences that, between your show Bible and then, you know, say, for example, naming or, um, you know, certain characters were adapted. What was the biggest difference between the show Bible you presented when it was finally done and the show as it appeared on television? Uh, the biggest difference is, uh, involves Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, and a pair of wings. <laughs> Uh, Pinkie Pie was originally a Pegasus for me, and Fluttershy was originally an Earth Pony. Um, and we were, I was simply asked to switch it because Pinkie Pie was an existing character without wings, and they felt, even though they let me make Rainbow Dash a Pegasus when she was originally an Earth Pony, they, they felt uncomfortable changing Pinkie Pie that drastically. But I, I didn't think it was that hard of a switch. I was actually, in creating the Bible, constantly debating whether or not Fluttershy should be a Pegasus. So mm -hmm. it was fine. Okay. Well, moving on then, of course, at the end of, uh, you know, the end of first season, you handed off the show to uh, Megan McCarthy and then also uh, uh, Jason Thiessen and, mm -hmm. and the guys from DHX or whatever. Have you been monitoring the show closely to see where it's gone since then? I haven't. <laughs> it, it hurts too much. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I I just, I just can't, I just can't bring myself to do it. It, it was hard to leave. I, I didn't want to leave. So, you know, seeing it go on without me, it, it brings up a lot of mixed feelings. Well, I think we're all, yeah, we're, we're all Thank here you. to support you. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think, well, I mean, you created something, I mean, a phenomenon here, and I think that it's really the core elements of the show that have really carried this through. So I think everybody here is glad that you're here with us. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Very happy. But you're, you're now working on some new projects. Yes. You're working on 
wander over yonder. Yes. <laughs> and can you say anything about it? Um, yeah, I can. I can only say, though, what, uh, what's already been out there. So I can't give any new information. And I, I wrote this down because I wanted to be, it's, it's a hard show to pitch. It's very unusual. I don't think you're going to be able to compare it to anything you've ever seen before. But essentially, it is an intergalactic buddy comedy about two best friends who travel the universe, leaving a trail of positivity in their wake. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, these two best friends are the over-enthusiastic, very innocent Wander, and his steed, the very pragmatic and tough as nails Sylvia. Uh, and um, it's a very kind of, it's not a sci-fi version of outer space, it's more of a kind of cartoony, whimsical, almost psychedelic version of outer space. And uh, Disney has been amazing to work with, and they really, really care about making the best shows possible. We have an amazing crew. Our star is Jack McBrayer, which we're really excited about. And um, yeah, it should be, it's, it's going to be airing sometime next year. We don't know the air date yet. Well, you're also working on Galaxy Girls as a brand. Galaxy Girl is a little bit in stasis right now. I don't know its future. Um, I'm just kind of hanging on to that until the right, uh, until the right opportunity comes up for it. Well, and do you have any other kind of projects you'd like to mention to the uh, the eager awaiting audience here? I wish I did, <laughs> but uh, Wander Over Yonder is taking up all of my time, and I'm um, very dedicated to it. And just don't really have time for other things, but uh, always, always look into the future, and you know, maybe this time next year I'll have some more news for you. Well, and I think it's like what you were just saying. When you're doing something right, it's all-consuming. Yes. All right. Well, we, I think we're going to open this up to Q&A here for a few minutes. Um, of course, once again, like every other of these panels, what's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, like everything else uh, with all these other panels, Lauren can't talk about anything that hasn't been aired or has, she hasn't seen anyway, probably. I don't know anyway. Yeah. Um, and so just, just keep your questions appropriate. And yeah, it looks like there's already a line there. So are we good? I think we're ready. Um, for did she do? Um, how do? How did you come up with her cross eye? I didn't come up with her cross eyed. <laughs> that was an animation error. The in, well, it was an animation error, but then the internet is everybody. All the fans of the show, everybody who's watching the show, were the ones that gave her her name, Derpy, actually. <laughs> and. Uh, it was, it was all born out of a mistake somebody made. Someone just kind of messed up and, and made her cross-eyed, and then she was cross-eyed ever since. I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, even though you're not involved with the show anymore, do you still watch it? I don't. I don't. May maybe I will, like, later, okay. but I Because don't right the now. television event of the year is coming up on the 10th, and I was just wondering if you were having a <laughs> <laughs> If you were having a, uh, a viewing party. I I'm not. Do you want to come to ours? <laughs> <laughs> big. Thank you. Hi, Laura. I want to want to say uh, first part. I want to thank you for for for, be, for doing what you're doing because if it wasn't for you, I would have not met my future wife, oh. Claire and I, because I, I proposed to her today for all who were here for the opening ceremony. So oh my God! For, for, and I proposed to her on stage, and I want to thank you for doing Congratulations. that. Congratulations! Thank you very much. And the question is, what was your inspiration behind Luna? Luna. Um, I can't point to a specific inspiration. Um, you know, just just stick into. I'm a big lover of theme, and we have these two sisters, day and night. And um, Luna, I wanted her to be a sympathetic character. I wanted you to because I wanted them to to make up in the end because the show's about friendship, right? So um, 
I, I just had these specific goals. I used the theme of night, but I wanted like what, what, what sort of thing could turn a character's bad briefly and bring them back again. Uh, it was just kind of piecing together a character that could suit the, the goals of the story, and, and that's where she came from. Thank you again, Laura. Oh, you're so welcome. C congratulations. Thank you. friend. Um, we're aspiring to be future animators and she's actually the reason why I came to like My Little Pony and she wasn't able to make it but it's, it's like her birthday's around this time so could you just say happy birthday to her please? Sure. Maybe? What's her name? Jennifer. Jennifer. Happy birthday Jennifer. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Hello. Hey. Um, if you get Wander over yonder, and if you get it to like a running start, just like you did My Little Pony, would it be at all possible that you would come back to My Little Pony if you found that you still had feelings for it? <laughs> <laughs> I, think I will it's safe always to... have feelings for it. Um, possibly, yeah. Really? If, if the conditions were right, but yeah, I, I miss it. I all miss right. it. Thanks for being awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is JC, and um, I was wondering, while watching the show, I noticed themes of discrimination towards ponies. For example, one, the Diamond Dogs see the ponies as workhorses. Two, Gilda the Griffin thinks all ponies except Rainbow Dash are uncool and lame. And three, the dragons at Spike meets in um, uh, Dragon Quest, they think ponies are, op they, they think so little of ponies that they openly discriminate um, or they openly disrespect Princess Celestia. So my question is, were any of those themes of discrimination intentional or just coincidence? Uh, well, the ones with the diming dogs, I think, are just a coincidence. Uh, they just see ponies as animals that they can use for their purposes. But with the other two, uh, those were kind of direct reflections on how I think most people feel about about ponies, about, you know, not, not the literal animals, horses, but people have a contempt for little girls' toys. And those dragons and Gilda, they, they have that contempt that a, a lot of people just, that you meet on the street have as well. It, 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 it was an int intentional reflection on that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Um, my name is Chris. I'm a big fan of not just My Little Pony, but also the Powerpuff Girls. Awesome. And awesome. Um, it's just really great to meet you. That's probably I wanted to say in front of all these people, because you were inspiring. And even more inspiring to me, because um, right now, like, I'm trying to create my own show. Like, I've already created, like, concepts and everything. And something I wanted to know was, um, what's it like to pitch a show? And how do you prepare to pitch a show? Not just, like, the actual pitch itself, but, like, beforehand when you want to give them a call or, like, when you need to prepare some stuff, what do you prepare? And I kind of wanted to get some steps so that way I kind of, like, do good on my first pitch. I imagine that's kind of a complex question, isn't it? It is. It is. Maybe, maybe like, the most important element of, of pitching a show? Yeah, that, that would be good. Well, the most important thing is, is your Bible because you leave it behind. Um, and it's you got to have art of your characters. Uh, it's good to have art of the world in the backgrounds, but not everybody can do that. That's not as necessary. Art of your characters, character descriptions, world descriptions, and an ex a few examples, short examples of what could be episodes. That's the most important thing. And then the second most important thing is when you do go to pitch, you, you're putting on a little bit of a show, so practice in front of your friends, and despite how nervous you get, you, you got to go in there and you've got to be passionate. You've got to show them how passionate you are about it, because they're not going to be passionate about it. So you, you've got to go in there and show how much you believe in it. It's, it's the only way they'll believe in it, too. Thank you very much. Welcome. I think that's true for everything in life, really. What? I think I was saying it's true for everything in life. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. Hey there. Um, I would like to tell you, I would not have ever watched this show when I first heard about it. But I dislocated my knee, and it was, oh, here's My Little Pony. I guess I'll watch it. <laughs> and it made life bearable for several months. And oh, good. It's a very precious thing to me. But I've been curious for a long time. 
why did you keep names like Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie if they've already been tainted by previous generations? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be careful when you say something like that at a pony convention. They're always fans. <laughs> Um, I, kind of, I, I had to, actually. Um, the legal process of naming things, especially when, ca when, toys, when characters are going to be toys that are sold all around the world, the, like getting names copywritten and trademarked is expensive and time consuming. So Hasbro gave me a big list of all the names that they still owned all the clearances to, and I picked from that list. I was very happy when Applejack was on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Lauren. Um, hey there. So, I heard a rumor on the internet that... Uh -oh. There are rumors on the internet? <laughs> Since when? Yes, yes, and I am, like, a, and it is very, very vague and unconfirmed. But I heard that Powerpuff, Powerpuff Girls will be coming back on air. Mm. So, do um, you know anything about that? Or is that just, like, some lie they made up on the internet? Um, I, I know a little bit bit about it, but I can't talk about it. Hi, my name is Monica, and I've been a huge fan of you and your husband's work of Powerpuff Girls and Home of and Fosters. And when I read that you and Tara were working on Friendship and Magic, I immediately was so interested in it. And if it wasn't for you and Tara, I, didn't, I wouldn't be into this right now. And I would very much like to say that you and her are my heroes. Oh, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hey there. Um, I have a question. Um, was there any person or people that inspired you to get into animation? Um, it's hard to say. I loved cartoons as a kid, and at a certain point, I started like learning about the history of it. And there are certainly like just countless numbers of actual artists and animators from you know, the past several decades that inspired me. Um, I'm not sure, like, n but not like any specific person that I know. It, it was a ambition I had, a dream I had that I, that I followed, but dozens and dozens and dozens of artists, both living and dead, that totally inspired me, yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Hello, sorry, I'm a little nervous right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name's Louis, Chelis, whatever people call me these days. Um, I was wondering, on the mythology that you said there was mythology, um, which mythology did you choose in order to create the story of Celestia and Luna? Um, you know, I, I can't point to anything specific. I think lots of cultures have um, myth, myth about the sun and the moon that kind of co co coincides with like creation stories and stuff. It, it's, it's done over and over and over again in, from, and it comes from so many cultures. I think I just wanted to do another one, but I wasn't, I wasn't pointing to a specific one. Okay, thank you. And congratulations for creating the world's best fandom right here. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's really almost an archetypal sort of thing, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, uh, I imagine you've, you've probably heard of Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It, I definitely get that vibe that there's a lot of, uh, you know, very archetypal you know, yeah. elements to the show. Yeah. Literally elements. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I know. I'm so, I had to get at least one b bad pun in. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hello. Hey there. Okay, two things. Yes. One, was there ever a job that you took for writing or drawing it that you felt not only improved your skills, but also gave it a boost to your career in general? Um, yeah, I, I, all of them. You, you learn something from every job you have, and you get a boost in your career from the people that you meet. Okay, and two, I was 
I'm the vice president of the Brony Club at my school, and I was kind of hoping you'd give a shout out to the GHCHS Brony Club. So what is that again? To the GHCHS Friendship is Magic Club. G H C H S. C H S. Yes. Okay. I need to write that down. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. So, okay. And and, and how does it? High school club. What's that? G H C H S. Friendship is Magic Club. Friendship is Magic Club. Okay. Given my shout out to G H C H S. Friendship is Magic Club. Thank you. That work? Is that okay? All right. Sorry, that was weird. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Lauren. My name is Eric. Hey there. Uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, it's okay. So am I. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't I'm really have a question great. as much as I do just a, a personal thanks. Uh, I've been a fan of your work uh, ever since I watched uh, Cats Don't Dance when I was a, a little kid. Oh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so, um, so I, I, I just really want to say is that um, I, I just want to give a personal thanks from the bottom of my heart for making the show because um, it's inspired me to not only want to actually do what it is I want to do with my life, which is directing films for animation and like, you know, and uh, I, I just love the show because of your ideology of how storytelling should be, be done with these types of characters. Thank and, you. And it, um, it just really resonates with me. And um, I was just wondering if, since I'm actually going on to make my very first movie, which is based on your show, oh, I wow. was wondering if, you could possibly give a shout out to all of the, my, my, my cast and crew um, working on a movie called Journey of the Spark. What's it called again? Journey of the Spark. Journey of the Spark? Mm-hmm. Hey there, everybody, crew of Journey of the Spark. Thank you so much. That's a big project. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to They've look got it animators up. and everything. It's ridiculous. Hi. Hey there. It's very nice to meet you. You too? Uh, yeah, I'm Tracy, or I go by My Tokyo Kitty. Uh huh. So I have a few questions. Um, I'll ask the easiest one first. If Hasbro allowed you to put your pony in the series, would you have done it? Um, no, actually. Aww. I I don't think she belongs in there. She, she messes up the at least the mythology that I had set up for it. Uh, she doesn't she doesn't belong. Okay. <laughs> well, we all love her. We all love you. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, my thank you. Other question is, um, well, first off, uh, my major is computer animation. You know, I want to get into cartooning, you know, storyboarding, you know, anything related to animation. How could I improve on that? Um. Practice. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I always uh, draw every day, but like it's when I draw, it's like same old thing. I mean, I just feel like I want to get better, like I want to improve more. You know what I always tell people, and, and this is frustrating, but unfortunately, it's the truth: is you gotta pretend you've got ten thousand lousy drawings in you, and you've got to get them out as fast as you can. Okay. <laughs> and the faster you get through them, the better. The, the sooner you'll get good, because that's, unfortunately, that's entirely what it takes. It's about doing it over and over again and, and uh, reaching out beyond your comfort zone. Okay. Well, you are a big inspiration to me, and two of my friends couldn't be here. Their names are Amanda and Rachel, and they just want to say hello to you. Hey, Amanda and Rachel. Yeah. And I want to speak for everybody. I just want to say thank you so much for coming out here and doing oh, my this pleasure. for us. Uh, we really appreciate my it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, hello, Lauren. Uh, hey there. My name's Colin. And uh, I had a few questions involving, um, uh, involving story creation and, uh, and getting it known. I, I'm creating my own series with a friend that I've known for quite a few years, and uh, we, he, he may not be the best artist, but he's my best friend, and he does a very good job, and we help create music and stuff like that, and uh, I was wondering, what's the best way to get, your, get, your, get, my, uh, get the story known, get, the, get the, the series known, because the series we're creating is called Spirit Seekers, and um, we we're really have no idea how to 
begin it, how to start it, because we don't know where to go, and we don't know how to get it known. You don't know how to get on the internet? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, that, I did. That's what I want. I want to do that with my friend, but he, he's, he wants uh, something legit, something in person. Some, so he wants to know where to go, what's a good place to go to get your story known and to get, get it sponsored, basically, sort of like that. I'd then, imagine everywhere, right? What's that? I'd imagine everywhere, right? Get it out there, just put it Yeah, yeah, you, you know, the, the it, it's hard, it, it is hard to get pitches to studios if you're not already working in the industry. Um, um, and if you, if you get a job in the industry, you kind of have to toil in there a little while before you, you get a good enough reputation to get pitches. But your best avenue to get it out there and to get it seen and to get it known without having to spend years in the trenches is to, to get it up on the internet. Okay. Um, and that way you can, you can anybody, anybody can see it. And it's tough, you'll, you'll have, and I don't know that much about it because I haven't done it much myself. Um, mm -hmm is uh, you know go to other uh, go to other art forums look for other artists um, contribute to their discussions and they'll contribute yeah. back to your discussions and see about trying to get it just get it out there and get it to spread um, well one more thing I also had was um, involving a specific character types like um, like epic genre characters characters that are epics or uh, um, tragedy tragic characters what kind of character would be believable, but also uh, b be believable when it comes to be uh, being a tragic character? Because uh, w there are a few tragic characters in our in our story plot, but it's also there's also funny and airheaded characters, and uh, we, I want to know how we can uh, develop a story plot with them matching together because um, we're not really sure on how to mix such serious characters with a. Uh, with lighthearted characters as oh. some, because that's 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 a hard question to answer. Um, if if you want to make believable characters, though, the the thing everybody always says is write write what you know. So if you have a story from your own personal experience, you just you just kind of have to be honest and and take that chance and take that risk and and just tell that story true. And, and that's the way you'll get it to be the most believable, because it's coming from a real experience. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I, so I want to take a quick poll of the audience, because I'm noticing that a lot of the questions coming in are about creative projects. Can, can we get a show of hands? How many people in this room right now are working on or have worked on a creative project that was almost entirely inspired by My Little Pony Friendship is Magic? Woo! Just so you know. <laughs> I think, I think that's one of the biggest strengths of the show, and this is something I wanted to personally thank you for, is that this show has inspired so much creative energy. Like, I think people look at it as an example of how to work hard and create something that high quality. Yeah, it's, it's been inspiring. Yeah, yeah. So. My name is Brett. And... Sorry, I'm just losing my train of thought. That happens a lot. Um, getting straight to the question, I've known that throughout most of your career you've been involved in animation and art. Have you ever grown tired of it, or do you keep your uh, passion for it strong? Um, you, you, you grow tired of it. It, it, it. it comes and goes. It comes and goes in waves. Um, you know, as a creative person, you have a specific vision and you want to see certain things a certain way, and, and you run up against obstacles, you know, that... Uh, are frustrating that can that can get you down. Um, it's 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 tough, but the, the the most important thing is to always work on projects that you're passionate about, that that you feel like you're um, uh, con personally contributing to, and then you can always find that passion again. Okay. Now, suppose um, you stumble upon that obstacle. What would you do if you were tired of animation or art? Altogether? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what I do. Um, maybe write books. <laughs> um, <laughs> but something, something creative. Some, uh, storytelling. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you.
Hi. Uh, getting straight to the question, when you were making My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, um, did you feel like something was holding you back, or did you feel like you had complete artistic freedom? You never have complete artistic freedom. You never, ever, ever, ever. Nobody ever has. Um, you, you try to work for the places that give you as much as possible. Uh, when we started the show, when it was first aired, the first most of season one, I, I can honestly say I felt like 85% of what I had in mind and what my vision was is what ended up on the screen, which is really good percentage. Um, uh, and I, I felt, you know, that, that the, in the beginning, I felt like I had a, a pretty significant amount of creative freedom. It was very nice. Thank you. Sure. Hello, my name is Christopher, or just Chris for short. Uh, I would like to ask you, you know all those crossovers on the internet? For yeah. example, video games, movies, etc. cetera. Uh, what do you think of them, and what is your favorite, if you have any? Um, well, the ones I've seen I think are great. I certainly haven't seen all of them. Um, and I have, you know, I, I can't, I wish I could say I have a favorite, but like nothing's immediately jumping to mind, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I haven't watched any in a while, so I'm, I'm not, it's not fresh in my mind. Sorry. Okay, um, and another thing I would like to ask, uh, bronies, I'm sorry if this ticks you off, but in one of my favorite online games, uh, known as Team Fortress 2, um, <laughs> No bronies ever played that game, come on. Well, there's a lot on <laughs> Team Fortress 2 these days. Anyway, in a recent Halloween update, the classes get, the nine classes get to dress up and the tanker known as the heavy, he wears a tutu, a crown, and wings, fairy wings, and one of his lines is, everyone, friendship is stupid magic. <laughs> what do you think of that? Sounds awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it, this is actually a phenomenon that's been going on for the past year especially, is that there have been a lot of video games, a lot of actually you know, shoot 'em up games that have thrown in little references to My Little Pony. I love it. Um, That's awesome. Borderlands 2 notoriously did. Um, you know, just a lot of little references in there. So I think, yeah. More power to them. I love it. So creators of video games, keep throwing those in there. Oh, yeah. Gabe New was a brony, by the way. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hello, my name is uh, Nick. Well, um, everything is already that I wanted to ask has already been said. So I just wanted to say thank you for being a big inspiration for me. And um, ho like, hopefully, this uh, like crazy cartoon fanatic will eventually become like a crazy cartoon creator. Well, I good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Would you say all cartoon creators are crazy? Yes. Yeah. I should say, too, while I've been up here on stage, I've gotten three text messages from various friends who generally are incredibly professional saying, thank Lauren for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aw, yeah. they're welcome. Hi, Lauren. Hey there. Um, so my question is, uh, I assume by now he's probably heard murmurs of it, but uh, I was wondering uh, whether or not Craig McCracken is aware of the brony uh, fandom, and if he is, what is his thoughts about it? Well, he's extremely aware. <laughs> um, It'd be kind of hard to hide that from him, wouldn't it? Yeah. You'd have to work at that. He he loves it. He's 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 a full supporter. He's really proud of me, and he's really proud of the fandom that's created. It's not much more to say than that. He thinks it's great. Awesome. And one last thing. I know your Alicorn OC's cutie mark is a uh, Quill and ink, so if you didn't have one of your own, I thought it would be kind of cool if you did. Oh, awesome. So. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. That's actually really cool. That's really awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hello, Lauren. 
Hey there. So, I mean, I've been a big fan of yours my entire life, starting at Cat Stone Dance. Thank and you. I would consider myself more of a fan, like your fan, than a brony. I mean, I don't want to ruffle any feathers or anything. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to try and mess with you. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> but I have a question about Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls. Have you ever planned on a possible male character? Because I'd like to think I speak for most of the crowd here. You're going to have a lot of galaxy guys with that show. <laughs> out. So, did you just coin uh, yes, that term? Yes, actually, yes. Yeah, abs absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hello? Hey there. Um, I was wondering, well, you were writing the show. Did you um, expect anything like this? Um, no. Fan base, I mean? No? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I, 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 I thought people were going to tease it and laugh at it and make fun of it. If, if they even bothered to watch it, I, I just wanted to make a good show for little girls. But I'm very grateful. <laughs> Extremely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, like, because I remember uh, an, an old post of yours during when season one ended and season two began when you announced that you weren't really going to stay on the show as much as you did. I heard that um, the production for the Candlelight Wedding was already in order. So I was wondering, when they um, approved Cadence, how did you feel about that? Because I heard you only wanted just Celestia and Luna's alicorns. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't really talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, first of all, let me just say thank you for coming. We all really appreciate this. You've made my first Brony convention 20% cooler. <laughs> uh, how fast did she do that? What? And how fast did she do that? Like in how many seconds flat? <laughs> as fast as the sonic rainbow. <laughs> but uh, my question is, I saw in Powerpuff Girls you, do, you did a lot of storyboards. I was wondering, what's the best way to get started being a storyboard artist? Um, in, in what way? In like learning to be a storyboard artist or getting a job as a storyboard artist? Uh, I, I guess the job. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the best way to get work is, um, if you know anybody who's working in the industry, is to ask them if they know of any open positions. Um, go to the websites of the studios and look for job openings and take anything. Anything like just, just get a portfolio of all your work together and send it to them? Yeah, definitely do, do that. that. That's one thing. That'll get you an art job. But if you get the opportunity to get like just a PA job or an internship, Take, take them. They're very valuable. Just make sure you don't get stuck in them. So you go there and you, you use those jobs to get to know people, to show people your work, to take people's advice and learn and grow. I always talk about one guy I worked with on Fosters who came in as a PA. He talked to me all the time. He talked to Craig all the time. He brought us his work. He took our advice. He would take the character design model lists and he would draw all... He, all the model lists, we never ever used them for the show, but he would show them to us, and we would watch how he improved and how he got better. And eventually, after a few months came by, another production, a, a storyboard assistant position came up, and he was hired because everybody knew that he was a good guy, that he worked hard, and he, he was improving. So don't, don't diss the, the little jobs. They, they get you in the door. All right, thank you very much. Good luck. <clears throat> We've got just a few minutes more in, left in the panel, so I think we've got time maybe for about three more What's after up? this What's guy. What's up, Lauren? Hey there. So I heard that, I heard that you're at um, the series premiere episodes has a magical girl influence. Can you please explain that? Explain? I think it's obvious. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. No, it's that. I was a little older when those shows came around. I was in my early 20s, but I saw the appeal, um, and I understand why they're appealing. So and good. sure, absolutely, that's that's the that's the first one. 
Um, so yeah, but I wanted to bring some elements in there just because I like them. They're fun. Rock on, Lauren and Faust. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that we've got time maybe for about a total of three questions now, so. Hello, Lauren. Hey there. It's an honor to meet you. So, you know. um, my question is, when you worked on ponies, was there any ideas from previous shows that you worked on before? Did I use ideas from old shows? Yes. Um, th there might be some, that, uh, some influences that might have kind of made their way over, but certainly not on purpose. And I just want to say um, thank you for coming out here. You are really awesome, and you know. Aww, uh, thank you. Uh, and keep up the good work. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Miss Faust. My name is Ian. Hey there. I don't have a question, but <laughs> I, I'm, as you can see, thousands of people are here to praise your work and giving a lot of people a better time. Uh, my dad and I used to watch my, uh, Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends like every day. It was, we just watched them all the time. And awesome. It provided a lot of good memories. And I started watching My Little Pony about two years ago, and it, I really got into it. And my dad always poked fun at me about it. It wasn't serious, but he got that I liked it, and he tried it once or twice. It wasn't his thing, but it just... He, it was, he, made, he was happy that I was happy. Well, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's good. That's important. Uh, in June, my dad passed away from a oh. long fight with emphysema. I'm so sorry. And it was a really hard time. <laughs> I understand. And I hadn't watched an episode in a long time, and I just got a chance to sit back and think about my dad. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hello, Lauren. Hey Hello, there. Bronies over 25. <laughs> I don't do a lot of what a lot of people do and do best pony, but one of the ponies I've always found most fascinating is rarity. And <laughs> The reason is, very specifically, because I realized, as somebody who's watched animation for as long as I have and watched a lot of shows over the years, I realized that a character exactly like that in a lot of shows would be a villain. Yes. She, she would be Diamond Tiara. And I was yeah. wondering if going in, if you realized that and if you specifically went about it in a way to make sure that she did not. Absolutely, 100%. I'm actually very proud of Rarity. That, I, that, that that came through, because I know girls like that, and they're nice. <laughs> and they deserve to be treated like nice people and not just be stereotypically assumed that they're snobs. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that that aspect of her personality came through. And I, I can say even from my personal experience, that when I was first watching the show, Rarity was the first example of where it broke a stereotype I was sure was going to be played out. Like, you know, when I first watched the first episode, I was like, wow, she's actually generous? What? You know, because she does fit a lot of those stereotypes. But I think it's like what you said when you wrote the Bible. You thought out the stereotypes and then you sought to destroy them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and I think it worked. So I think we got time for one last question. And, and I think it's an, Thank a, you very much. an appropriate costume. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I got. I, This is very surreal for me. <laughs> I can't hear you. Nope. Hello? Okay, testing. Okay. I like to thank I like to thank you and all the people behind my little pony for actually bringing on the show. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have made new friends and I wouldn't have learned any values of making friends. Pretty much what sums it up is friendship is magic. And my question is, how long did it take you to uh, learn animation? And like, how long was the process of learning it? Uh, well, I can't answer that because I'm still learning. You never, ever, ever stop learning. Uh, but to be a little more specific, I went to school. I went to CalArts to learn animation. I was there for two and a half years um, uh, before I got offered a job. And then every job you have after that, you learn something new and you learn something every single week you work. So still, still learning. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You look awesome. Well, to wrap this up, on behalf of myself, my entire crew at Everfree Network, and also just tons of my friends, I want to thank you for creating a show that inspires so much creative energy. I think that these questions that we've heard here today shows that this idea, this you know, what you created in your Bible, what you started, has inspired a lot of people to not only better themselves, but to also create their own individual content and really push for their own goals. So on, my, on behalf of myself and, and everyone that I know, thank you for that. You're welcome, and thank you, everyone, for coming out and for supporting the show and for you know getting the idea out there that four girls doesn't mean lame. Thank you, thank you, thank yep. you. Guys, Lauren Faust. Thank you.